With that being said, come with me to Psalm 19 this morning. That's where we're going to open. It's tradition here at Surprise Christian Church to stand in reverence and honor for the Word of God, the first reading of Scripture. So if you'll please stand with us. We're in Psalm 19 this morning. I actually want to jump forward to verse 7. We'll begin there. It says this. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule over me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, as we gather as Surprise Christian Church this morning, Lord, it is my earnest desire for the people listening and gathering here that they would view your commands, your teachings, your word, your presence as more desirable than anything in life, God. More desirable than money or power or sex or anything else this world might offer us, God. I earnestly want for everyone in here to desire you more than anything else, to desire your word more than anything else. Help us, God, teach us. And cleanse us, God, as we talk about forgiveness today. Help us because there are sins that we don't even know that we've committed. Forgive us. Wash us clean with the blood of the Lamb. God, and help us as we've been freely given to freely give to others. Help us as we receive forgiveness to offer forgiveness. Lord, you're an awesome God. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Humble us this morning. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus, name above all names. Amen. So we're continuing our series on prayer. Go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we'll be. Of course, we will be talking about the Lord's Prayer as we have these last few weekends. We began this series by emphasizing why prayer is so important. And so the first teaching we gained together was from the Apostle Paul, who told us to pray without ceasing. And remember, we liken this to breathing, because what else do you do without ceasing? You need to breathe. And if you stop breathing, what happens? You die. Right? And so you pray without ceasing. If you stop praying, what happens? You die, right? There's spiritual death that comes with that. Our connection, our relationship with the Lord is cut off. We, we must always be in prayer. And so I emphasize, I think this is the most important thing we do as Christians, is to pray. There is nothing more significant. And so I wanted to convince you to begin to become a people who pray. And so we've been learning from Jesus these last few weeks. We saw in the first weekend how we are to pray our Father and call God our Father and experience the love and the mercy of God, but also that we should have this reverential, fearful awe of who God is. And we focused on this idea of the three yours, your name, your kingdom, your will. And then last weekend, we began a new three, the three things we request from God, give us, forgive us, deliver us. Last weekend, we talked a lot about give us this day our daily bread. Provide for us. Give us all that we need. Today, let's read this next passage in the series. It's short, obviously. There's one passage. We're in verse uh, 12. So he says, give us today our daily bread in verse 11. And Jesus teaches us to pray and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we're going to jump down. One more verse, past 13, in verse 14, because Jesus continues. He says, for if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Would you agree with me that that short statement, will not forgive your offenses, makes this a pretty serious deal? Yes? 
Is there anything more terrible that any of us could imagine than God not forgiving our offenses? Than God denying us forgiveness? What we're going to talk about today is certainly challenging, but it is an essential part of what we believe as Christians. Without it, we can't be saved. Without it, we can't be saved. And it's this simple idea of forgiveness. And so we're taught to pray always and continually. And Jesus teaches us that this is how we should pray. But remember that weekend when I put up all the statistics of how people pray? Do you remember where praying for forgiveness made it on the list? You remember? There was all these ones about, you know, take care of me, provide for me, urgent situations, praying for the health of family members. These are the ones that people gratitude. These are the ones that people most often pray for. Forgiveness was like way down here. Okay, we had about 15 other things in that list. And forgiveness for most people, it was like 30% somewhere in that range. And remember those stats were once every three months. Which means 30% of people who say they pray once every three months, so four times a year, okay, only pray one of those times for forgiveness. Once a year, they pray for forgiveness. I want to just simply put this out there. Given Jesus' teaching about forgiveness that we just read, do you think that an effective prayer life includes only one time a year that we ask God to forgive us? All right. One time a year. And if I had to guess, I'd say that's probably Easter service, <laughs> okay? That's the one time a year that most people genuinely pray and ask God for forgiveness. No, it's so much more important than that. So if we're having this idea of praying always, and Jesus is teaching us to pray, pray for forgiveness, how often should we pray for forgiveness? Always. Always. That it should be a constant part of our walk with the Lord. But you may think to yourself, Drew, I don't feel like... I always need to ask God for forgiveness. You know, one of the things that shocked me many years ago, I was in a small group and I was with a group of people who had been in church for a very, very long time, had been serving in ministries, had led, had even been in pastoral leadership positions and we were all sitting together and we were talking about sin and we were talking about praying and asking for forgiveness. And the person who had been in ministry for 20 plus years, no joke, and had been at high levels of ministry, okay, they said out loud in this small group, Drew, I don't think I have anything to ask forgiveness for. I haven't sinned. And I went, whoa, what? No, I, I haven't sinned. I, I, I don't know why I would ask for forgiveness. It's, I haven't killed anybody. You know, I'm, I'm faithful to my spouse. I, I do the things God asks. I haven't sinned. What, what might I need to ask God forgiveness for? And it, I was like, you know, I mean, it took me back. I heard some gasps in here. I mean, hopefully that took you back. I mean, it was crazy. It was wild to me. And I, and I just was left with this thought, what's wrong with our church and the way that we teach that someone can go 20 plus years and serve in leadership and not recognize they need forgiveness? Seems like a pretty serious deal, doesn't it? That's kind of a bad thing to overlook. All right, but, but I think if we were honest, if we were truly clear with one another, that for many of us, that is a true thing that we think in our hearts. Lord, why, why do I need forgiveness? And doesn't the stats bear that out? I'm only praying once a year for forgiveness, and my thought about myself is that I'm a pretty good person 364 days of the year, <laughs> all right? And then there's one day where I just kind of make up for all of it. That's not how Jesus teaches us to live. It's not how he teaches us to think. And I think that mentality creates a narcissism in us. It creates a narcissism in us that causes us actually to treat others with an unforgiving and angry heart because we believe that we deserve better. So I want to take this serious because it is serious. It has eternal consequences, but it also has consequences for the way we live right now and the way we treat one another. So here's where we have to begin. We begin with this prayer. It says, forgive us our debts. I love that word debt. Jesus is expressing to all of us that we owe something to God. We have a debt. That's what a debt means, right? There is something we owe to God that we have not paid. And Jesus is saying that we need to ask God as our uh, person who we owe a debt to forgive us. Okay, if you went to your bank and you said, hey, can you forgive my mortgage? How do you think they would respond? Okay, they'd say no, probably. I mean, I don't, <laughs> maybe you get lucky. Maybe try it after service, okay? And, they go, and they're like, yeah, I, can't, I couldn't wait for somebody to ask, okay? 
But as human beings, we're very unwilling to forgive debt. It's part of how we're wired. All right? And in that case, they probably wouldn't be so smart for the bank because they'd go broke. They'd not get the money that they need, that they loaned out. All right? But it's hard. It's hard to give forgiveness for debts. So, so why do we kind of think with God all the time? We don't take it with any type of seriousness, but we just throw it out there. Well, God forgives all my debts. And our debts are infinitely more serious than our mortgage, okay? The debts we owe to God. And so we must pray. We must seek God and ask, forgive us our debts. But that can only happen when we acknowledge that we, what? Have a debt to pay. You can't ask God to forgive a debt that you don't believe you owe. So we have a task this morning. We have a task to show that all of us owe God a great debt. So let's begin with this idea, okay? First, let's demolish the idea that anyone is a truly good person. And when I say those words, I know how controversial that is. Again, something that surprises me very often when I talk to people in the church. So often when you ask, are people fundamentally good? The response is yes. And I question why that is. Why, why are we who are the ones who have a cross hanging behind us all the time, the first ones to say, no, humans are good. We're, we're good. God, God accepts us. God thinks we're good. Truth is, no, no one is truly a good person. You can substitute in there, no one, all right, does not owe a debt to God. There is no one who is debt free when it comes to God. All of us owe a debt to God. Where to begin with this? I just want to keep it simple. Come with me to Luke, okay? Come with me to Luke chapter 18 and go to verse 18. I want you to let this challenge you this morning, all right? Luke chapter 18, verse 18. There's a series of teachings which are amazing, and and they all come together, but we're kind of skipping down into a little bit further of the moment. This is the story of the rich young ruler. Are you guys familiar with that story? This rich young ruler comes and asks Jesus a question, and here's how he opens. It says this, a ruler asked him, asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a pretty good question, is it not? What what do I do to inherit eternal life? What was Jesus' response? Verse 19, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, no one is good except who? God alone. Okay, so that, that shatters all of it for us right there, does it not? That ends the conversation right there. Here's why. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is in every way sinless. Jesus is in every way perfect. He is in every way the human being God desired us to be when he created us. And when someone comes and calls him good teacher, he's the first one to, in a sense, correct him. He doesn't just take that and accept that. Well, yeah, I'm a pretty good teacher, right? I'm a pretty good, I'm pretty good. He he, he tells them, why do you call me good? Only God alone is good. If Jesus hesitates, to take on the phrase good, why are we so quick to do it? Do you hear me, church? If Jesus hesitates and says, no, only God is good, even though he's the son of God, he's fully deity, he's fully perfect, and he corrects someone, don't call me good, in that sense. Who are you and I to grow on saying, no, oh, we're all good people? Are we bold enough to say that we're better than Jesus? Okay. So, so right away, Jesus himself brings us all to the same foundation. There is no one who is good but God alone. There is no one who is good but God alone. When people hear me say that people aren't truly good or that they aren't born a fundamentally good person, they often hear me say that means that everybody is as worse as you could possibly be. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that every human being is a serial killer, okay? You know, I, there's a movie that's out now, and I encourage you. I, I know there's another number of young people in the room, and it's a sensitive topic. So, so if it, I just want to give you a little prior warning, okay? But, but that people seem to be really enjoying. I haven't seen it myself, but Sound of Freedom, you guys heard, heard of the movie? Okay, I, I've heard a lot of people who've gone and watched it. 
and a core part of the, the plot of the movie is, is the character trying to stop sex trafficking of children. All right, that's what he's doing. He's trying to undermine these organizations. And in the midst of that, I saw this article posted not too many days ago of a situation that happened in Brazil where a young girl, age of 12, was, was kidnapped, stuffed in a suitcase, okay, dragged off by this person just in broad daylight in Brazil. Just took her from her family, put her in a suitcase, dragged her off, put her in the car. The, the people noticed. They called the police. The police eventually found her. And, and thank God, and she was alive. But of course, when they found her, she was tied to a bed with signs of sexual abuse, right? And the plan was that that was going to happen every day of her life until they no longer could have use for her. And then they would harvest her organs and sell them, okay? And they do that every day by the hundreds and by the thousands, all right? There is real evil in this world. And I'm not saying that every human being is that person. When I say that we're not good, everyone th seems to just jump right away. So you're saying I'm like that? No. No. What I'm saying is the reality of sin and the brokenness of the human race is what allows something like that to happen in this world. All right? That isn't God's doing. That's our doing. And a lot of the times we have this tendency to dissociate. You hear stuff like that and you say, well, that person is a monster. You, you dissociate it from being a human being and I'm right here with you, of course. They are probably possessed. There's demonic influence, no doubt, that that is happening. And we say that they're, but we can't dissociate. They're human. They're human as you and I are, right? What takes them to the point where they would do or perpetrate something like that, that is a hard question to ask, but they are still human. They're still human. So when we say that we are all fundamentally good, I think it just puts on blinders and we ignore the reality of our lives. When you walk outside these doors, you don't see that in the world. I'm sorry, you just don't. You don't see a bunch of people living as they should. You don't. I want us to think about this idea as well. So we, we get this idea, okay, we're not good people. There's sin, there's a reality. Don't miss this also in the prayer. What does is, what is Jesus teach us to pray? He says, forgive who? Us, our debts. Remember I, I said that all of these prayers are, are plural. They're asking for forgiveness. Not God forgive me, it's God forgive us. Forgive all of us collectively. This is an idea we struggle with in the West. But it's something that we need to understand. Actually, let's go back into Daniel. What we read together, that beautiful prayer. Do you remember? Come with me to Daniel chapter 9. Come with me to Daniel chapter 9. Go to verse 4 of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel gives this beautiful prayer to the Lord, and he says this. I pray to the Lord my God, and I confess. He's confessing sin. O oh Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Notice, is this in the singular or the plural? We have sinned. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day public shame belongs to us, the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far, and all the countries where you've banished them because of the disloyalty they've shown towards you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, our ancestors, because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions that he has set before us through his servants, the prophets. Did Daniel reject God's prophets? No. Did Daniel reject God's law? No. Did Daniel, by his own actions, cause the exile? No, but he includes himself in the ones that need forgiveness. 
You notice his prayer isn't, God forgive Israel. All those jerks back there, they got me here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> if they would have just lived like I lived, I wouldn't be in Babylon. We'd st- I'd still be in Israel. Forgive those guys. What a bunch of dirty sinners. What does he pray instead? Forgive us for sins that Daniel himself had not committed, but that his people, the people of Israel, had who he includes himself in. I'm not saying God holds us accountable for other sins. What I am saying is that human beings, we all have a part to play in the realities of this world. You may not be the worst person who's ever lived. I don't believe you are, but you are human. You are human. And every moment you've sinned in this life, you've contributed to the reality that brings about Horrible crimes like the one I just described. For example, and I say this with no anger at all, I just, I want you to hear me. For a long time, for me, one of the struggles that I had, as many young men do today, was pornography. The Lord has done miraculous things in my life. But I want to say, and this is not a male problem, by the way, I know that. So women in the room, hear my sensitivity to you. I was shocked when I learned at seminary, but it broke all my categories. Porn addiction, 53% male, 47% female. It's almost 50-50. Okay? We define it as a male issue. It is not a male issue. Your daughters are every bit as susceptible to porn as your sons are. You need to hear me on that. Um, there are many conversations I've had in this church with the daughters who belong to this church, okay, that they have also expressed. Uh, this is something I struggle with. So don't, don't limit it to just men. It's a human problem. But you think about that for a second. When, when, and this is, again, I'm not trying to condemn you. That's not my point. But when you, when you participate and you consume pornography, does that in some way contribute to the realities I just described? Okay. Does that not contribute to sex slavery? Does that not contribute to the kidnapping of young girls? Young boys, too? I'm asking that as a serious question. I mean, if you want to vindicate yourself and say, no, it doesn't, I mean, I'm not doing that. I'm not helping that at all. But don't, just be honest. Right? And I know I'm speaking to almost every person in this room has consumed porn in the last month, according to the stats. You know that? And I don't believe that that's true. I mean, so many of you I know are devoted followers of Jesus. But you need to hear me this morning. This is not condemnation. This is truth. And we all need to be brought low and recognize the way we contribute to the sins of this world. So when Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us, that's for a reason. So often the evil of this world, we dissociate and say, well, that's not my problem. No, it is our problem. And Jesus already teaches us to pray, God, forgive us, the human race, have mercy on us because of what we do to one another and the ways that we reject you. Second, okay, Let's demolish this idea that anyone can become a truly good person apart from God. So we recognize, no, we're not good, but maybe I can become good. Maybe if I do enough good things, I'll make up for the bad things. That's not true either. Come with me back to Luke. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. This is an amazing parable. It's one of my favorites in the whole scripture. But it would have been unbelievably controversial in Jesus' day. Luke 18, verse 9, it says this. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Okay? Some who believed in themselves that they were a good person. Is that not what that means? And they looked down on everyone else. See the consequences that come from thinking that we're good? All right. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, a religious leader, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, like a pastor, as I am, was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, even tax collectors. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Okay, you may not use those words in your prayers. 
See, sometimes we come before God and say, God, thanks for making me so great. <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not like those people. Thanks for making me so awesome. But the tax collector, the one he just condemned in his prayer, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So on the one end, the guy who's a religious leader, a pastor, a leader, he goes to God with all his things. He says, God, thank God I'm good, not like those people. The tax collector recognizing his sin comes before the Lord and simply asks, have mercy on me. Who do you think was the one that was forgiven? Jesus says it was the one who cried out for mercy. If we come to God with all the good things that we do and we say to God, look, I, I am trying to make this right. Look at my good things. And then we use that as the basis that God should forgive us. We are the Pharisee who says, God, look, I'm a good person. Yeah, I make mistakes, but there are real bad people out there, not like me. Okay, so just forgive my mistakes. That's cool. But I, I, I'm a good person. I'm trying to do what's right. Versus God, I have nothing to offer you but to ask you to forgive me. Third thing, we need to deepen our understanding of how much we need forgiveness. I want to talk about sin for a minute, all right? I'm, again, I want to bring it back to the story I opened with, the, uh, the person, the lady who shared with us that she had no sin. You see, we perceive sin, and I believe it'll be up there, as this first thing here. Wrong things that we do that we know are wrong. That's how most of us define sin. They're bad things that we do that we know are bad. Okay? Like a kid, you tell them, don't touch the stove, it'll burn you. And then they know, don't touch the stove, it'll burn me. And then they go and they touch the stove. All right? For most of us, that's our definition of sin. And I think that was this lady's definition of sin. I think, unfortunately, that's what we've been trained to believe is true in the church. All sin is, is the things that are wrong, that you know are wrong, that you do that you shouldn't do. That's what sin is. You did a wrong thing, you think it's bad. That's all sin is. And so in that sense, we might all say, okay, today I didn't do anything bad. I didn't lie, I didn't cheat, I didn't, I didn't do anything this morning that was wrong before I came to church in that sense. So I might come here and say, well, I'm sinless. I've obeyed God and I've done what he's asked. I don't have sin. But here's the problem with that. The scripture doesn't limit sin to just the things we know are wrong and that we do. Remember the psalm we just read this morning? Sometimes sin is wrong things that we do that we don't know are wrong. Do you hear that in the psalm? Do you remember what David said? He said, forgive me, cleanse me of my hidden faults. Cleanse me of my hidden faults. The things I don't even know that I'm doing wrong, cleanse me of those too. Does something only become wrong when we know it's wrong? No, guys. Something doesn't just become wrong because I know it's wrong. It's just actually wrong. And so even if I'm not cognitively aware and saying, no, that's a wrong thing and I do it, it's still wrong, is it not? It's still wrong. There's an objective reality to wrong. But the scripture goes even deeper. Not only are there wrong things that we don't know are wrong that we do, but there are righteous things that we do that are wrong. You say, well, that makes absolutely no sense, Drew. There are, I can do the right thing and it be wrong. Yes. We can do righteous things, the things God commands, and they be wrong. You know how I know that? We just read it in that chapter in Luke. What did the Pharisee do when he came to God? He said, God, I tithe. Okay, I obey the law. I'm righteous. I'm glad. I'm not like that loser. Okay, so are the right things he's doing right or are they sin? They're sin. They're sin because he's doing them wrongly. I'm not doing them because I want to obey God. I'm doing them because it makes me better than that guy. 
In Isaiah chapter 64, I encourage you to read it, the whole chapter. But there's this short section, which I love, in verse 5 and 6, Isaiah is talking about the people of Israel. And the people of Israel also tried to obey the law, but they mixed it in with all sorts of idol worship and adulterous practices. They were bringing cult prostitution into the temple. I mean, it was pretty terrible stuff that they were doing. But because they were doing the things that the law also asked, they were mixing those things together, they thought, I'm good. I'm doing what this God wants, and I'm doing what this God wants, and I'm checking all my boxes. God says through the prophet Isaiah to them, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags to me. And the exact word he uses is menstrual rags, period rags. Okay? Your good deeds are what? Disgusting to me. They're disgusting to me. So there are times we do the right things in the wrong way such that they are disgusting to God. Here's the last thing. (laughs) Sometimes, sin is not just the things we do that we know are wrong. They're not just the things that are wrong that we don't know are wrong. They're not just the things that are right that are actually sin. But they're sometimes the things that we don't do that we know are right. Okay? And this is easy. If you saw the circumstance that I described earlier with a child being kidnapped, And then you thought to yourself, no big deal. Just let it go, (laughs) right? Say, hello, you can have them. You know, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to call the police. I don't want to do, I don't want to intervene. You know, they're all yours. Is that a good thing to do? Or I guess in this case, to not do? Would you say that we all, if we recognize that, have an obligation to do something to stop it? And then if we fail to do something to stop it, we've sinned? Okay, do you see with me how deep this is? This is not just, hey, there are those wrong things out there that I don't do, and I know are wrong, and then as long as I don't do those, I'm good with God. There are things we don't know that we're doing that are wrong. There are things that we don't do that we should be doing. There are things that we should be doing that we're doing wrong. I don't say this, okay, to come in and start beating you like a punching bag. I say this for you to recognize the reality of your life. It is impossible. Before you walked into this church this morning, you sinned. I can guarantee it. From the moment your head came off of that pillow to the moment you're sitting in front of me, there was something that you did or didn't do or should have done that sinned. And Jesus says, and the apostle writers say, that the wages of sin is death. One sin is enough to eternally separate us from God. So before you walked in here this morning, you merited yourself eternal separation from God. I want you to hear that the task of being a good person is impossible. It's impossible. You can't do it. You can't make up for the sins of the past. You can't do it on your own. You will never enter the kingdom of God on your own merit. Ever. So, we have a debt. A debt that we can't repay. You remember this stuff recently about student loans and things like that that are going on in our culture? I want you to imagine that you just have infinite student loans. You couldn't decide on your degree. You went to like a thousand different colleges, okay? Every time you lived off of all the money, you you spent it wastefully. You have a debt so big that just accumulates because the interest is so high. This is the problem with some people's student loans. The interest is so high that you can't even pay... You can never get to pay the principal. You never get to pay the actual amount you owe. You just pay interest forever. And even then you don't pay enough because you're not paying enough interest. So the interest just keeps adding. That is the reality of our sin. Our sin is such that you can't even pay the interest. So what do you do? Well, why don't we go to the guy that we owe the debt to? And maybe he'll be kind enough forgive it. But we can't do that unless we acknowledge first that we owe a debt. So the question becomes, why should we always pray, Lord, forgive us? It is because you are always in need of forgiveness. 
you are always in need of forgiveness. It is a reality of your existence that you are always indebted to God. And my friends, this is why the cross is so beautiful. If we deny everything I just taught from Scripture and we think people are good, the cross has no purpose. Why would Jesus die for good people? They're good. He doesn't need to. They're going to heaven on their own. Why would I die for someone that... They're good. I mean, they're, they're fine. They're going to heaven. The cross is pointless. The cross is pointless unless we first understand that you are indebted beyond your wildest imagination. To God. But there's a second portion of this that I think denying this reality causes serious harm in our lives. Come back with me to Matthew. That's where we'll end. Because there's a second part of this prayer. We said, forgive us our debts. But then we also have a second part to this, which is, as we also have forgiven our debtors. I want you to notice that the first one, forgive us our debts, is present tense. God, forgive me right now. The second request is what? It's past tense. As we have already forgiven others. Why is that so important? What we began with this morning. If you go to God to ask for forgiveness, a prerequisite requirement of that is that you've already forgiven. And then Jesus just makes it abundantly clear, as we read together. If you do not forgive, what will happen? You won't be forgiven. So I point out, we have an unimaginable debt that we can't repay. And then Jesus tells us, just straight out, if you don't go before you ever come to me and forgive, truly from the heart, the people who owe a debt to you, I'm not listening. You're asked for forgiveness. It's a prerequisite. In other words, we can't go to God and say, forgive me, and I will eventually get to forgiving someone else. You hear me? We can't say to God, forgive me, provide me forgiveness. I'm holding on to this right now, but someday I'll get there. But for now, forgive me. We have to let go of that first, and then we can ask and receive. That is an unimaginably difficult teaching. But it is absolutely the truth. I want you to hear me this morning. God's desire is to show you mercy. That is his want. How beautiful is that? That for all the sin of human beings, even as I described earlier, for all the sin of those wicked, vile men who around this world are doing those awful things this morning, God's disposition towards them is to show them mercy. Isn't that an unimaginable thing? I don't think mercy when I think of them. I'll just be honest. I don't. And I pray God help me with that because I don't. I don't feel this desire to go, I want them to receive mercy. I don't. That's not my first thought. But God's disposition truly towards them and towards you and me is mercy. He wants to forgive us. But it is his law, it is his law to treat us as we treat others. God's desire is to show you mercy, but it is his law, it is his requirement that he binds himself to, that he will treat you as you treat others. Jesus says, the measure you use will be measured out to you. Whatever measure you use for others will be measured out to you. So it's not just, hey, a prerequisite for forgiveness is to forgive. It's also the way you treat others is how God will treat you. Every action you take against another, God looks at you and says, okay, that's your standard. Better meet it. Okay, so, so let me ask you a question. Do we not want our standard to be mercy? Knowing the reality of sin and the need for forgiveness, do you and I not want our standard to be mercy? That in this life, the way we interact with other people, our disposition is as God's is. I want people to receive mercy. Because you have to meet the standard you hold. So if the standard you hold is pure justice, you better be able to meet pure justice. You see, Christians 
should be the least prideful people on the planet. We should be the least likely to think of ourselves as good. We should be the least likely to think of ourselves as righteous. We should be the least likely to be pretentious or patronizing. We should be the least likely to be angry, aggressive. We should be the least likely to be unforgiving or bitter. Is that true that we are that way? Here's my reminder to you. God will hold you to the standard you hold others. If you don't like that, maybe you need to make an adjustment to your standard. One last story, one last passage. We'll read this and we'll pray. Matthew 18, Jesus tells us this very thing in a parable. He says this in verse 21. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. That's a massive amount. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I'll pay you everything. I don't think he will eventually pay him everything. And the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him his loan. How beautiful. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, way less. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. And here this last line. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Okay, is it real now? So I only have a simple prayer today. I, last week I gave us some examples of prayer. I just, I just have a simple one that I want to encourage you to begin praying and make it part of your life, a regular part of your life. Not just once a year, but always. It's the prayer we read from the man, the tax collector, who kneeled before God and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's simple. I believe that that becomes a part of your everyday prayer life. Not only will it transform your walk of God, with God to an actual walk with God, but it will transform the way you treat other people. I promise. Because once you recognize how great your debt is and how good your God is, it will be impossible to hate. It will be po- impossible to be unforgiving. It will be impossible to be violently angry. When you recognize how much you've been forgiven, you will become truly a humble servant of God. Pray with me. Let's get out of here. Lord, I have one simple ask. And this includes me as much as it does everyone else. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. God, forgive us our sins, our debts, as we forgive and already have forgiven our debtors. Lord, you're an awesome God. Thank you for your grace. I praise the name of Jesus. Amen.